This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. So, um, I'm Gilles Bronsbourg, the Executive Director of the ANS, and it's my pleasure to welcome tonight our speaker, uh, Dr. George Green. Um, I heard about his works um, last year during um, a conference in uh, Hanover, Germany, where uh, Dr. Brennan MacDonald from the University of Basel mentioned his very interesting um, uh, studies of uh, Roman gold, which is uh, our topic for, for tonight. Um, Dr. George Green reads classical archaeology and ancient history at Priest Church, Oxford, and in 2016, his project on Roman gold won an Arts and Humanities Research Council Collaborative Doctoral Partnership Synergy. That's a long title. <laughs> <laughs> which he held at the Ashmolean in conjunction with the University of Warwick. Uh, presently, Dr. Green is the Lavery Shaffery uh, Early Career Fellow in Roman Art and Archaeology at Lincoln College, University of Oxford as well as the Leverholm Trust Early Career Fellow at the Ashmolean Museum. At Oxford, he teaches the course Roman Architecture, Imperial Culture and Society, and Cities and Settlement, in addition to conducting the Roman half of the Greek and Roman coins um, course uh, for the scientific methods in archaeological um, course. His research interest sits at the intersection between Roman archaeology, archaeological science, and numismatics. Dr. Green's current research project uses XRF, LAICP, MS, and negative muon XES to investigate the major and trace element composition of the gold coinages of Rome and its African and Asian neighbors. The goal aim being to build a better picture of the gold supply networks that existed in these various regions and how they interacted with each other. I would add as well, maybe the circulation of, coal, uh, of gold coins, the way they were melted as a result of conquest. So, um, without further ado, George. Thank you very much. Um, I'm quite lucky this evening. I, I get to introduce a very, very cool um, technique um, that uh, our, our collaborators down at um, the Harwell Science Campus, which is just outside of Oxford. Um, it's a big particle accelerator. Um, they've been really, really generous with their time about letting kind of cultural heritage groups and, and letting numismatic groups um, into their facility. And so th this is a really a product of um, archaeology, museums, and some seriously um, high-tech physical sciences all, all coming together. So, so it's, I'm, I'm very lucky to be able to present this uh, this evening. Um, so the main case study is, is about the year of the four emperors. Um, this is the most recent case study we performed down at the Harwell uh, Science Campus. Um, um, but the talk, I'll, I'll, give a, I'll give a brief overview of the technique. Um, so it's, it's muonic, so hence the mu symbol, XES, so X-ray emission spectroscopy. Um, the technique is. Oh, is it not shared? No, not yet. Okay, that's a good idea. Sorry about that. Yes, you good. Hold on. It's good. Okay. Um, so yeah, so I'll, I'll be talking. I'll be explaining what the technique is. Um, so kind of, uh, it's muonic X-ray emission spectroscopy. So muon the mu. Um, the technique is so new, there's not really a, 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 kind of a, comp, a kind of a consensus of actually what to call it. Um, so there's lots of different names from it, but for it, but obviously kind of our name's the best. Um, so we'll be, I'll be going through our very first proof of concept case study, um, which is about investigating surface enrichment in Roman gold. Um, and then we'll get on to the main case this evening, which is about the AD 68, 69 civil wars, um, looking at some really heavily debased coins um, that exist in the Ashmolean collection. Um, which kind of give a bit of a different pattern to what we what we see in other analyses of these civil war coinages, um, and then also an insight into some debasement and manufacturing techniques. There's something um, kind of very very interesting going on with these heavily debased coins, um, which the muonic uh, X-ray emission spectroscopy allows us to see and be absolutely confident that it's really there in the metal and not uh, not a case of something going wrong with a, an analytical technique or some kind of surface problem. 
so what am I talking about? So uh, a muon is, is a subatomic particle. Uh, it's a type of lepton. Um, but in layman's terms, it, it's essentially an electron with mass. It's a, it's a, it's a fat electron. Um, these are created at the uh, a particle accelerator facility um, at the unfortunately named uh, Isis neutron and muon source near Oxford. Um, this is the size of a couple of aircraft hangars. Um, so unfortunately, it's not yet a portable technique. Um, so everything needs to be going needs to go down there. Um, the muons are accelerated. Um, they're given a fixed momentum, um, and dependent depending on that momentum, um, they penetrate different depths into your sample. Um, they essentially fly in between the atoms of your sample, um, only being captured by nearby atoms when they've basically run out of steam. Um, when captured by an atom, uh, the muon tries to drop down the various energy levels within the atom, um, giving off muonic x-rays as it goes. Um, we detect these x-rays, and the whole thing operates a bit like x-ray fluorescence, which hopefully people are slightly more um, familiar with. Um, this is, this is kind, of the, the, the kind of the capture diagram. Um, so the muon goes in, it gets captured, it drops down these energy levels in this sort of GCSE level kind of um, diagram of, a, of, an, of an atomic structure. Um, and each time it drops down the level, uh, an x-ray is emitted. Um, so like XRF, the energies of the resulting x-rays are characteristic of the atom of the element which captured the muon. Um, so you detect the x-ray and you can work out um, what, what it came from, basically. But unlike XRF, um, these muonic x-rays are much, much higher energy, um, meaning they can escape from um, deep beneath the surface and actually be detected. Um, so traditional XRF, you detect secondary x-rays from roughly the first 10 microns in gold coins. That's kind of fractions and fractions of millimeters. Um, with the muons, um, we've been able to do 400 microns. That's about half a millimeter, um, completely non-destructively. Um, so I mentioned detecting. Um, so here's our experimental setup. Um, the, the muon cannon is, is, is at about 12 o'clock, and the, de the detectors surround the sample on a cross axis. Um, the absolute dream is that the facility would be able to build a, a ball of detectors um, that can totally surround the sample. Um, this would increase the speed of the measurements massively and also um, increase the sensitivity of the technique. Um, but at the moment, we really are at the, the, the very, very beginning stage of, the, of this technique. So um, the coin is, is held in sort of aluminium foil and we haven't actually built a, a proper sample holder yet. Um, so there's, there's lots of kind of bits being bodged together um, because it, we really are just shooting muons at objects at the moment. Um, I mentioned earlier that the different momentum sample different depths. Um, so for gold coins so far, we use low and high momentum measurements. Um, we shoot the muons at the entire face of the coin. Um, so our low momentum muons give us a slice about 10 microns deep into the coin. Um, the high momentum muons give us a slice about halfway through a, a circa sort of one millimeter thick Roman gold coin. Um, and I stress the, the, these, are, these are independent slices. These are not bulk measurements. Um, it means we can detect the difference between different layers of a sample. Um, so here is basically a, a, a four layer sandwich of different metals. Um, so it's about two and a half millimeters thick and we've kind of layered four different metals on top of each other. Um, we shot the muons at them and basically we, we, you get these distinct slices as you, as you go through, through the sample. Um, you don't get it all, all the metals all at once. You get slices from each individual layer. So uh, the, the, the sort of 400 micron implantation depth that we're using, we get a slice about 30 to 50 microns thick of the very center of our coin, totally independent of the alloy before and after it. Um, so as a bit of a sum up, really, and a bit of in, in, in praise of the technique, um, the muonic uh, X-ray emission spectroscopy technique is, is, is totally non-destructive. It's, it's penetrative. It requires no sample preparation. Um, it doesn't present a conservation risk by dirtying or altering the sample. Um, it doesn't present a safety risk by leaving the sample irradiated um, and can be practically applied to a wide range of object sizes. Um, these qualities present loads and loads and loads of advantages to those working on cultural heritage objects. Um, to start, the, the, the muon beam can be safely aimed at the most um, aesthetically or, or historically or archaeologically or artistically um, interesting part of the object. Um, a discrete location is not actually needed for penetrative sampling, um, so the scholar is able to have much more freedom when investigating um, their research questions. 
Um, you don't have to do any kind of sample preparation, no, no cleanings needed. Um, the objects aren't left irradiated. Um, so the burden placed on museum administrators or conservation departments is, is greatly reduced, um, which obviously means it's more likely for people to say yes to you to work on their um, collections. Um, because, the, because it's got a controlled penetration depth, um, there's no need for something like a freshly excavated object to be cleaned or corrosion or rust on a, on a metal object to be, to be removed um, before the experiment takes place. Um, this all leads to a, a wide variety of potential applications, um, whether it's high value objects like I'm working on, the gold coins that I'm presenting here, um, or looking at corrosions, gildings um, beneath the mud of a shipwrecked object, um, or looking at kind of the substructure of objects. Um, there's also the potential that a whole object can be hit with muons and the composition at different parts um, be determined, which means you can develop like sort of a heat map um, of, of a concentration of certain elements within it. Um, which could be really interesting for sort of the mixing of, of alloys. Um, so, so with that in mind, we, we applied it to kind of some, some Roman gold coins in the Ashmolean collection, um, asking a, a, a pretty simple question basically, was, was what we see on the outside actually what's in the inside of these coins? Um, so we wanted to show that the core measurements that we do with the muon technique, this penetrative um, kind of analysis actually worked. Um, and that our numbers can be compared to established techniques like X-ray fluorescence. Um, the reason for this is that X-ray, portable X-ray fluorescence takes you know, 30 seconds, a minute, two minutes, however, how long you want to spend on it. Um, to run the muon technique, it takes hours and hours and hours to get really good results because we have so few detectors at the moment. Um, so if we can show that the XRF and the muon technique produce the same results on the surface, then we can just screen everything with the XRF technique and then use the muons to do what is really unique about them, which is go deep beneath the surface, totally non-destructively, to make sure the surface and the core are the same. Um, so we did this on three coins, um, two, uh, two ori of Tiberius and Hadrian, and then a Solidus of, of, of Julian. Um, uh, so first, make sure it works. Um, so we used uh, some gold alloys of certified purities um, to make sure the technique is working. So here they're Mac 1, 2, and 3, um, and they decrease with purity as you go across the screen. So Mac 1 is about 94% gold, Mac 3 is about 60%, and Mac 2 is about 75% in, in, in the middle. Um, the easiest thing to do is to focus on the gold peaks on the far right of each graph, um, about, you know, about 400 kilo, kilo electron volts. Um, the important thing to note is that the intensities of the peaks drop as you go down, um, down in purity across the screen. Um, so Mac 1, 94% gold, begins at about sort of 250, 300 sort of intensity. Um, you drop down to Mac 2, 150 to 200, Mac 3, 80 to 100. So the gold purity, the gold, intensity of the gold peaks is are going down as the purity of the gold um, certified materials go down. Um, so it, we, we know it works. Um, even, without being, uh, even without being calibrated, um, but when we, op when we uh, analyze the coins, we use these three standards to calibrate it, and then we also use 99% um, pure disks of gold, silver, and copper, and a 70-30 gold matrix to make sure that the, um, the results we're getting um, are both precise and accurate. Um, so a brief reminder, um, we used low momentum for the surface measurement and a high momentum for the interior measurement, which was a slice about halfway through the coin. Um, the resulting spectra are shown here um, the low momentum surface measurement is in yellow and the high momentum interior measurement is in red um, offset just above it. Um, the key thing to note is that there's no extra peaks suggesting extra elements hiding beneath the surface. Um, so for example, a fake that's made of lead or tungsten. Um, and there's no radically different patterns in the intensities of the various peaks. Um, we'd be worried, for example, if just after 300 keV, um, the red line shoots upward um, suggesting there's actually lots of silver beneath the surface. And what you see is, is that the silver on the surface and the silver in the very middle is, is roughly the same. Um, basically for um, Tiberius and Hadrian there's basically nothing, and for Julian there's, there's, a, there's a little bit. Um, this is easier to see when we compare it to the um, X-ray uh, fluorescence results. Um, in terms of numbers, they come out pretty good compared to XRF. Um, especially pleasing is the congruency with the Julian result. Um, the coin of Julian II is, is slightly debased, um, so there's a little bit more room for error there than the essentially pure coins of Tiberius and Hadrian. Um, you'll also notice that the high and low momentum numbers are the same, um, so again, so showing us that there's, there's no surface enrichment problems. The surface is representative 
of the core. Um, so with our sort of concept proof and the method being sound using XRF to kind of screen things on the surface and then using the muons to go deep inside, um, we started on the AD69 Civil War investigation. Um, during the AD68, 69 Civil Wars, um, Galba, Otho, Vitellius and Vespasian um, fought for and gained control of the Roman Empire. Our textual sources all suggest this is the period of serious and um, sustained disruption. Um, however, existing analyses of gold coinages produced during this time um, only show kind of a, a minor reduction in the purity of the gold coinage, kind of one or two percent. They don't show real kind of drops in the purity. Um, when we put the Ashmolean's 44 ori from roughly this period um, through the XRF, um, we noticed that a, a, a small number of them were really heavily debased, well beyond this small wobble that we already know about. Um, and some even contained high concentrations of copper, um, which is really, really unusual for Roman gold coinage. It's actually vanishingly, vanishingly rare. Um, the most interesting coins we put through the muon setup, um, along with some of the full purity ones, um, to ensure that what made these coins unusual was actually caused by their manufacture and not by some sort of contamination or environmental process um, on the surface of, of the coin. Um, so here are the results from the, um, the muon work. Um, so let me just walk you through the graph. Um, so first, the, the reigns of each of our emperors are given different shadings. Um, we start with Nero and we go through to most of Vespasian's reign. Um, then we have two sets of results. The hollow markers are my um, X-ray fluorescence results from the 44 ori produced before, during, and after the AD 68-69 Civil Wars. Um, these, are, these are hollow because the XRF only analyzes the very kind of surface, the outside of the coins, not, not the insides. Um, the solid markers represent the uh, muon measurements from the insides of the coins. Um, so this is the subsample of 12, and it's solid because the muons go, go all the way through the, um, the sample. Um, these are all linked to an, to an XRF result of the same coin, and thankfully the muon and the XRF results for the coins that had both of these analyses are basically on top of each other. Um, so the first thing is that the Romans, even during a time of crisis, are not surface enriching their gold coins. Um, the broad alloy on the surface of the coin is representative of the alloy in the center of the coin. Um, we can validate the existing pattern of, of analyses that there's a slight regular drop of one or two percentage points during the Civil War period. Um, but there's things to add. Um, there are three heavily debased coins produced around AD 68, AD 69 that are as heavily debased in the center as they are on the surface. Um, these sorts of debasements are not seen again until the third century crisis. Um, on top of this, we can also show that Vespasian really couldn't return to a full purity aurea straight away. Um, it takes him three or four years to start producing a regularly few, full purity gold coinage. Um, this all speaks to quite serious economic disruption caused by the events of the year of the four emperors. Um, so these, these are just a reminder of those immediate conclusions. Um, slight debasement, even in the time of crisis, no surface enrichment. Um, the production of the heavily debased coins and the three emperors are, are, are the, the sort of level we see in the third century crisis. And Vespasian, it took him a while to get back, um, back to full purity. Um, the coolest coins, though, are these heavily debased ones. Um, so these, these are the most interesting ones. Um, so I'd like to focus on the muon work that we did on those. Um, so to start with is the, is the comparison um, in the in the red blocks uh, um, between the coins of Galba. Um, so we start with the heavily debased arrays of Galba next to one of his full purity examples. Um, so the XRF for the, for the coin of Galba comes back at sort of 99.6, the muon work 99.8. Um, we go to the heavily debased one, 89.3% for the XRF, 89.4% gold for the muon work. So again, really, really high quality results. Um, they're congruent, um, which is really, really pleasing. And it shows that the heavily debased coins um, really are that heavily debased. Um, this 10% debasement is, is very, very real. Um, next, we have a really good little study on four um, of the RIC9 type ori produced by Otho, um, one of which is the heavily debased one down the bottom on the, on the black triangle. Um, two of these coins are essentially made at full purity. Um, one, one is made at sort of slightly debased at about 98.5% pure. 
Um, this is the sort of wobble that's frequent during, during the Civil War, this one or two percent wobble in purity. Um, and then one is produced right down there at 84% pure. And again, um, the muon results show that we can be absolutely confident this is what the alloy in the very center of the coin looks like. This is, this is not a result of some kind of surface problem. This, this, this massive debasement contrasted with this very high purity gold coinage it is definitely real. Um, these were all struck in Rome between the 15th of January and the 16th of April, AD 69. Um, Otto's regime was quite clearly technologically capable of producing a full purity coinage. Um, there doesn't appear to be a coherent decision to systematically debase this series of coinage, either slightly or seriously. And so the relatively chaotic production of this coinage must be seen as a reflection of the chaos of the time. Um, finally, we have this, um, finally, we have this unusual coin under Vespasian. Um, it's the blue marker that's kind of set down from, from the rest of them. Um, the typology is quite odd. Um, it has an uncertain mint date, uh, uh, an uncertain mint location. And the date of the issue is, to the best of my knowledge, um, a, a broad Vespasianic date. Um, but again, serious discrepancy in the purity of this kind of very odd typology with, with the rest of Vespasian's coinages. Um, the heavily debased issue, I think, is unlikely to have been produced during the more stable parts um, uh, later on in Vespasian's reign. So this is, this is more likely to be a kind of a civil war issue. Um, regardless, even if it is part from, even if it is during kind of the, the period that he's debasing, even even after the eighty sixty nine civil wars, the normal one to three percent debasement we see under Vespasian is nothing like this kind of uh, kind of seven or six or seven percent debasement we see in the, in this coin. So. What's going on with these issues? Perhaps the decision was made to stretch the gold stocks by heavily debasing only some coins rather than all of them. Um, the debasements that we identified were relatively short lived and should probably be seen as the product of, of the acute instability brought on um, by the civil wars, the various civil wars that these claimants for the throne were, were fighting. Um, we have to assume that the fiscal inadequacy of the claimants. Um, played some part in these debasements, um, but we can't rule out that our competing emperors did not always have access to the time, resources, and skilled labor needed to produce a consistently high purity gold coinage. Um, to get a consistently high purity gold coinage, you have to use a, a, essentially a, something called a salt cementation technique. Um, this involves hammering out gold into very thin foils, um, baking them with salt and a different and some acids. Um, the salt strips the silver out from the from the thin foils and then you have to take it out beat them again into a thin foil strip the silver out again and do this over and over and over again it's it's a really intense um time and skill intensive activity so it makes sense that in the civil wars perhaps this wouldn't be able to be accessible to the emperors at all times um but regardless the, the level of debasement seen is not insignificant um ori that are only 80 percent to 95 percent pure aren't produced again until the third century crisis um which would give some idea of the true scale of disruption caused by these civil wars um, if these debasements are totally deliberate, um, then this represents clear evidence of the true scale of the fiscal crisis faced during the AD 69 civil wars. Um, if it's accidental, um, then this has got to be indicative of, of a serious disruption to the normal functioning of minting operations. Um, in the previous hundred years of production of Roman gold coinage, these, these sorts of massive errors are, are just non-existent, basically. Um, even if it is an accident, um, the decision to allow Ori that were of low or uncertain purities out into circulation um, reflects the unique fiscal strains of the time. Um, simply put, our various emperors needed gold coinage to meet their obligations um, and could not afford to have a particular gold stock rejected and reprocessed. Um, the, acquiescence of these um, the acquiescence of these particularly um, low purity examples um, can perhaps be seen in the addition of copper to their alloys. Um, so, all three of the heavily debased coins contain unnaturally high concentrations of copper. Um, native gold would expect to have about 1% copper. If we start seeing more than this, then, then we can be, start being more confident it's actually been deliberately added into the alloy. Um, a color change can be detected in gold with, with colorimetric methods, at about 95% gold, 5% silver. Um, and so copper can be used to make gold look more gold. Um, covering up the pale silver content in the coin with this kind of darker copper, it makes it kind of a more gold color. Um, but again, they're clearly acquiescing to a very low purity gold coinage if you're going to whack a bunch of copper into it to hide the fact that the, the gold contains lots of silver. Um, so first, we've got the two coins of Galba. Um, the 
despite having radically different purities, um, the use of copper to balance out the paling effect of silver means that the coins end up roughly the same sort of color. Um, then we can look at the muon spectra from this, or muon spectrum from, or yeah, the muon spectra from these two coins. Um, so these are the muonic X-ray spectra from the interiors of these two coins of Galba that I've just put on the screen. Um, the important thing to note is the lack of peak at 330 keV um, for the 99% pure coin of Galba. Um, there's no copper in it um, versus the pretty clear bump just after 330 um, for the 89% coin of Galba. Um, the alloy definitely contains significant concentrations of copper. Um, the negative muons allow us to confirm um, that the copper concentrations detected by XRF are real. Um, the alloys really do contain 2 to 6% copper, and the copper detected by XRF is not a result of some kind of surface contamination, error, or environmental process. Um, the addition of copper into Roman gold coinage um, had previously only been observed during the debasements of the mid third century. Um, because the negative muon technique enables us to be totally confident that there are significant concentrations of copper in the fabric of these coins, we are able to bring back the earliest use of this particular debasement technique in gold by the Romans um, by 185 years back to the AD 68-69 civil wars. Um, with all this fiscal chaos in mind, um, we can start seeing some really good agreement with the broad narrative that our ancient authors are trying to sell us. Um, our ancient writers are all in agreement that both our competing emperors and the state generally were under considerable fiscal strain. Um, Suetonius and Cassius Dio accuse Galba, Vitellius and Vespasian of being greedy, money grabbing or parsimonious while emperor. Um, Tastus repeats such comments against Galba and Vitellius. Um, both Otho and Vitellius are recorded as having considerable personal debts. Um, Galba is accused by all our authors of not paying out the donatives he promised the troops. Um, Vitellius, according to Tacitus, did not have the funds to pay out to the army what he had promised and attempted to reduce troop numbers. Um, and Vespasian is presented as reluctant to pay out further donatives to the army by both Suetonius and Tacitus. Um, finally, we see these various emperors attempting to increase their revenues. Um, Galba attempts to recoup about 90% of the value of gifts that Nero had given out. Uh, Vitellius's troops were apparently particularly rapacious, and Vitellius himself apparently oversaw the confiscation of wealth from his opponents. Um, and under Vespasian, the Senate accepted a loan of 60 million sesterces shortly after his victory. And on his accession, Vespasian re-implemented taxes remitted by Galba. Um, he created new ones and he increased the tribute due from the provinces. Um, so with these analyses, um, the metallurgy of the gold coinage is now in much closer agreement with the broad uh, narrative favored by our textual sources. Um, Interestingly, one of the more mundane claims made by Plutarch in the, in the life of Galba um, was that when Galba revolted, Otho was one of the first provincial governors to join his cause um, and brought with him silver and gold drinking cups and tables that, would be, that were to be melted down into coinage. Um, if this is not an invention of Plutarch and the, the relative banality of this claim may lend it credibility um, compared to sort of the more moralizing claims that I've detailed above, um, then both Galba and Otho are implicated in recycling um, precious metal to make recycling precious metal objects to make their coins. Um, such objects would have been of uncertain purity, and so their use may well have contributed to the sort of erratic purity of the gold coinage in this period. Um, I've been talking for long enough. Um, so the broad conclusions from this is that with the negative muon technique. We've shown totally non-destructively, and that's the really cool thing about this. To get this sort of information, we normally have to section a coin all the way through or drill right the way through it. Um, but this, we can do it non-destructively. We've shown that the range of purities we can see um, in the, both the core and the surface of the coin are the same. Um, with these results in mind, we've got to assume that the fiscal adequacy of our civil war claimants played some part in the debasements. Um, but we can't rule out that our competing emperors just simply didn't have the time um, the resources or the skilled labor to actually refine their gold coinages properly. Um, thanks to muon technique, we're able to confidently state that the three most heavily debased ori in the Ashmolean's collection um, from the Civil War period um, contain 2 to 6% copper. The earliest use of copper as a debasement technique in gold under the Roman Empire can now be securely dated to the AD 68 69 Civil Wars. Again, because we can be absolutely sure it's in the very center of this alloy, it's not just a surface problem. 
Um, and finally, it seems that a few years recovery time was required before the state was able to start producing Ori at full purity again, which hopefully gives an indication, along with the kind of the, the narrative favoured by our texts, um, of the sort of economic disruption that went on um, during these wars. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. Can you hear us in the room? Yeah. Um, Mr. Schaefer, do you want to ask your question? Yes, uh, in the calibration spectra, I noticed a peak. I think it was about uh, 340 keV for the um, XRF, but not for the uh, muon method. Uh, why is there that difference? Um, the 340 keV will be a, will be another gold peak. Um, so that's so gold, silver, cop, uh, silver, and gold both have multiple peaks on on that um, graph. Um, but it's not a. There's no um, that doesn't. That, I didn't present any uh, X-ray fluorescent results on those MAC calibration standards. It's just the um, it's just the muons. And yeah, there'll be different gold peaks or different silver peaks. Um, that's why you have kind of multiple peaks in that area. I hope that makes sense. No, excuse me. Uh, on, on the graphs that you showed, you specifically said no. Notice that the peaks in the uh, yellow and red are the same. Right. Uh, it was one of the about the fourth uh, slide that you showed, and uh, I'm asking. Uh, there was one peak that was not the same for in the yellow and the red. It was just in the yellow. Uh, okay. Let me get the. Can you go back to those. There were three uh, three plots. I I think. <laughs> Yeah. And you said going from left to right, I think there was a, a greater concentration of gold. Almost, keep going. <laughs> oh, that's it. That's it. Uh, let's see now. Oh, no, no, this is, uh, let's see, three. Um, uh, no, no I, I have to apologize. In looking at the graph now, the red and the yellow peaks do seem to always be the same. I could have uh, sworn I saw a sharp peak that was only for the, um, for the yes. XRF. If I can, if I can scratch through, um, you might be thinking about these no. graphs, perhaps. This was it. If you look at yeah. about 350 keV, isn't there a yellow peak that is not in the red? Yeah, uh, the red peak is exactly the same as the yellow one. Um, and so basically, we've, we've offset the red line so you can actually see it. So for both these cases, the, the red line was actually on top of the yellow one. Um, so you couldn't actually see it. So we, we've offset it ever so slightly so you can actually see it. Even in this case, the, the red line is still basically on top of the yellow one. So I promise there is an, there is an interior peak there um, for, for gold. It's, it's, it's a gold peak. Okay. I believe you. <laughs> thank, thank you. Well, I mean, I, I, I think it'd be a real shock if, if Roman ori weren't made of gold. Um, so I think, I think, I, I think I'm, it's, a, it's a safe assumption to make that it's a gold peak. It's okay. Mr. Wolf, would you like to ask your question? Yes, I'm curious with such a small sample, is it really possible to have more than minimal confidence that these results hold generally? Um, that, there's a real difficulty when you're looking at un unusual things, um, that the unusual ones by definition kind of aren't representative. Um, so we know that the slight wobble in the purity, this kind of one to three percent slight debasement, um, that's definitely representative of, of what's going on. 
um, the unusual coins, these heavily debased unusual ones, are unrepresentative by the fact they are unusual. Um, but the fact they exist points to things going terribly wrong. Um, like I said, in the previous 100 years of Aureus production, this, these sorts of errors simply don't happen. Um, they, they never put copper in the gold coinage in the previous 100 years. They don't do it for another 100 years afterwards. Um, they don't make these sorts of errors where you drop down to kind of 80, 90% pure gold coins. It, it just doesn't happen for another 100 years. Um, and so, how, I'm sorry, how is it that we know that without doing this kind of analysis? Um, well, there's been a huge, there's been lots of XRF analyses of um, what well, basically I've done 573 Roman gold coins from, our, from the Ashmolean collection through um, X-ray fluorescence that gives me a whole range from the Roman Empire. Um, then at the CNRS, um, which is a, there's a French research French research group um, with Arnaud Suspen and uh, Maurice Blelamarcan, um, and they've done lots of work on some Trojanic gold. They've done lots of work on early Imperial Roman gold. Um, as well as back in the 1980s, um, they did, um, there was another group there um, who did uh, pro, uh, proton activation analyses of some um, late Roman gold coins, but as well as a, a few subsamples from um, the main Roman um, imperial period. And everybody's results are all pointing to the same conclusion. Um, the Roman gold coins are the same, generally speaking, the same on the outside as the inside. Um, but we do have a really good indication of the of the purity of Roman gold coinage across um, across time. Whether it's from kind of really old fashioned specific gravity results right up to um, XRF activation techniques and now um, muonic uh, emission spectroscopy as well. Thank you. That's that is very informative, and it does really bear on the generality of the conclusions because there's such a background of additional information from the other methods that have been applied. Thank you. No, you're welcome. Thank you. Excuse me, I have, I have a second question, if no one else does. Um, in uh, studying, doing dye studies of Roman Republican bronze coins, there's a, somewhat of a problem with coins that look like imitations. And uh, it would be nice to uh, submit those to a uh, metallurgical analysis to see if they were different, if they were really were imitations or just an engraver who was a little different. Do you foresee individual coins being allowed to uh, be sent to this uh, facility? To yeah, be I mean, yeah, th th this, this, so there's, um, muon sources are pretty rare. Um, I think there's about five in the world, I, I think. Um, with the big ones that do cultural heritage, um, the Harwell Science, Camp, Camp, Science Camps in the UK, um, the Riken facility in Japan. I think there's um, some muon sources being set up in, in the States, but I'm afraid I'm, I'm not super on top of where that's happening, but there's definitely some being set up in the States. Um, but whether it's going to be negative muons for culture, that will allow cultural heritage, I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Um, in the UK, you submit a proposal to the BEAM um, and you explain why you want to do it, what your reasoning is, what you hope to get out of it. Um, and then there's a panel that sifts through them, ranks them, and then awards beam time. Um, one day on the muon beam costs about twenty thousand um, pounds. So a, a whole week, which is what how long? Well, it took about it took us ten days um, to do the Civil War gold, the, just the, the twelve results, um, and that came in so obviously about you know two hundred thousand um, pounds. But that's a contribution in kind because you, you make the application and then it's free at the point of access. Um, so yeah, absolutely. If, you, if, if, there's, if you have a specific project, um, you have collaborators in the UK, you have collaborators in Japan or even in uh, Switzerland, for example, near the, near the, the source there, I believe there's a source there. Um, then, then yeah, you can, you can ask them to submit a proposal and generally speaking, it's free at the point of access. And um, doing these sorts of um, studies and asking kind of weird and complicated questions of the technique um, is actually really useful for these muon groups as well because the sorts of questions we ask about um, the coins and the alloys and the restrictions we place on them um, mean that they have to understand their technique more, they, they, they have to kind of tweak it um, and they have to answer difficult questions which means they get better at using the technique. So you know, so actually it, it can be really useful for them. So, and so they are, so especially the one in the UK, they've been really open to doing cultural heritage stuff. So yeah, absolutely. One, one coin can go in on, on half a day. Um, yeah, absolutely. All right, thank you. For our questions in the room, in theory, these mics above us should work. 
So you can ask your question aloud, but I also ask if you could just repeat this question as well as you can. So ask your question, and then if you repeat it when you answer it, okay. for the maximum possible you know, so capturing for, it. For my university, I wrote a thesis about the coins of Windex, a usurper or rebel in the south of Gaul in the year 60, spring of 68. And one of the things I tried to do is I tried to say, decide whether or not there are silver coins attributed to him. Are there bronze coins? Are there gold coins? I hadn't seen that in scholarship before. And I had found in the British Museum's collection about three or four ori that had the same portraits, the same design, the same you know, uh, legends as the silver that are that are attributed to Windex. So I have to say the subject fascinates me because I'd love to be able to do this as a view on them. But have you have you considered the role of Windex and perhaps his coinage maybe setting the standard? Maybe he was the first to debase the, uh, the, the gold and many others followed him. Uh, so I think the, the, the first of the question was about, about the technique and being able to do it. Um, so back to the answer previously, that yeah, if you have, you have a project and, and you want to kind of pitch the British Museum to let their coins go out to the facility, um, pitching those projects is, is not easy, but, but they're very open to them. Um, and about the specific interest in, 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 in Vindex, I, I don't, at the moment, I don't personally have that particular research interest. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of gone over the Roman Empire. Um, but yeah, absolutely. I mean, you could do even some basic work with some XRF to have a look at the surfaces of them, um, just to see what the what the, um, uh, the concentrations are on the surface um, would be really informative for, for seeing if there's, there are some debasements earlier on. Um, but yeah, and so if, if, if I'm not sure who in the British Museum would be able to do that, but I think they've got some XRF kit there. So I'm sure if you kind of sent an email in and asked very nicely, they might be able to run three coins through an XRF setup for you. Yeah. The other part about it. I've also read the uh, same source as you have right in this room, but <laughs> it's my study, I, I get to look at it very closely, those ancient sources, and I was wondering if there's any connection between the, the, the uh, devaluation of the gold that Nero initiated, I think circa the year 66 CE and, and the Civil Wars. So you think it could be a continuation of, of Nero's devaluation that went from like 99 to like 95 percent pure to 90 so we said okay we can take it to 90 and then due to the lack of confidence in the gold that people raised it again uh so, so, so the, the question was about about nero's um messing around with the, with the gold coinage and that being in, impacting on the on the civil war um debasements nero reduces the weight i don't think he reduces the purity of the gold coin um so he he reduces the weight down to the neronian standard of, of 7.26 7.3 grams whatever you want to call it um, but I believe the purity stays the same. Um, and I believe also there's, there's no crisis in confidence in the value of them. This would be um, one of a series of weight reductions that's happened over the last sort of 100 years. Um, we begin with the Julius Caesar with over eight grams. By the time we get to um, you know, even Nero's kind of very early coinages before his reform, we're at seven and, seven and a half-ish. Um, so going down to 7.26 is, is just one of a series of, of, of drops. So I think in terms of confidence, we're okay with these weight drops. And um, as part of my, my doctoral thesis, I, I looked at hoarding patterns of gold coins. Um, one of the things you see is, is that people are happy to hoard different weights of gold coins um, together. Um, they don't seem to discriminate between higher weight issues and lower weight issues in this early period, um, in the studio Claudian period. So as soon as they produce a low weight gold coin, um, or a, you know, a, a weight reduction, people are happy to use it straight away. Um, so there doesn't seem to be any crisis of confidence in this Julio Claudian period. Mid third century, when you start, we get, you get Caracalla dropping it down to six and a half, and then we start getting, you know, you know, five and a half, threes and twos, and all the weights produced in sort of uh, around, you know, 80 to 60. Um, then, we, there's, then there's a real crisis of confidence in the gold coinage, and we start seeing gold hoarders who, from the time of Julius Caesar, right up to the early, th uh, early third century, who, generally speaking, nine times out of 10, they're just storing gold coins when they want to store gold. Suddenly in the mid third century, this goes down up to kind of, you know, um, only about 40% of people who are storing gold are now doing it solely in object form. And um, so we see, start seeing a use of bullion and bullion like objects replacing gold coins in the mid third century um, because there's a crisis of confidence in, in, in the gold coinage as well as a, a variety of other complicated factors. And, but one of them is definitely people start 
not trusting the gold coinage as a store of wealth. In the kind of latter half of the third century, we still have this tradition of we still have this use of bullion um, and bullion-like objects, um, but we also see gold coins also coming back into hoards. Um, and that's because, in my opinion, that um, that's the point where the gold coinage starts circulating by weight. And there's such a massive variety of weights, they can't all have the same face value. They must be acting like circulating pieces of bullion at that point. And that's why they're stored alongside objects. So it kind of all makes sense in that sense. But that's where you get a crisis of confidence, not, not, under, not under Nero. We have another question online, if you want to ask your question, Mr. Kayser. Thank you. Um, yeah, I actually had a, a couple of questions, but I don't want to monopolize things. So if, if I need to yield after the first and come back to it, that's fine. Um, so first of all, just a general remark, this is really great stuff. Um, I'm, and I, I should mention um, that I'm partly asking with a, with a certain physics background here. Um, so the first question is, you, you spoke briefly at the beginning about calibrations, and I wondered about the self-shielding. So the x-rays emitted from the core have to mostly go through the outer layers. Even if they're only emitted from the core, they still have to travel through the outer layers of the coin. And so there will be some absorption, and that absorption will, of course, be energy dependent. So how did your calibrations take into account that self-shielding? Um, I mean, the, the muonic x-rays are so high, such high energy that the, the self-shielding is not, self-absorption is not that much of a problem for us. Um, the, so these are really almost like soft, uh, soft gamma rays that just go right through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, um, the, the Beer-Lambert equation, right, um, can give you a vague idea of um, the kind of the escape depth. So for XRF, um, because they're, they're kind, of a, kind of nine kilo electron volts, you've got 10 microns. These at 350 kV, you know, 100, time, 100 times more than that. Um, so self-absorption, self-shielding is, is really not a problem. Um, there obviously there there are small problems which which leads to an uncertainty figure. So the uncertainty of lots of this is about kind of um, if we say it's ninety percent gold, there's a plus minus of about zero point eight percent generally speaking. Um, so that that leads to the, an uncertainty value. But but in terms of self absorption and it being a massive problem, the the um, they're so high energy that that's not a major problem. But it definitely does lead to some of the uncertainty figure, um, which is a bit of a cop out answer to say it's in the uncertainty. Yeah. No, that all, that all makes sense. If I can proceed with my second question, if that's not too monopolistic. Yep. So the second question was, so so preface this remark with a question with a remark. I'm really glad to see that somebody has finally built the muon microscope. I mean, you have an electron microscope, you have a muon microscope. In ordinary electron spectroscopy, ordinary XRF, all the different techniques, you probably know even better than I do, all the different versions, um, is differently sensitive to different elements. Having to do with the sensitivity, the you know the reaction of the of the individual atom to the impinging whatever it is, electrons or whatever is going to generate the um, energy pulse that will result in the uh, X rays being emitted. Um, are there similar sensitivity differentials with muon spectroscopy? Um, for whatever reason, having to do with the way the muons get absorbed and the different energy levels of a muonic atom, for example greater or lesser sensitivity to things like lead, mercury, and platinum? No, no, it's, I think, um, so I didn't include a kind of a, a graph that shows this. Um, and if, um, if I can get your details, I'd, I'd be happy to forward that on to you, but basically we can do pretty much everything. Um, I think with real fiddling of the setup, I think you can even get down to hydrogen and, and helium and stuff like that. Um, you can do some, yeah, it, it, it's really impressive what the muon groups can do with this technique. Um, but no, we can um, we can do it. We can do basically everything. Um, some things are more difficult than others, but at a fundamental level, um, they can do a full range of elements on the periodic table, give or take some kind of crazy stuff that you're not really interested in for cultural heritage or kind of any real stuff. But but yeah, generally speaking, it, we can do a full range of elements. And there's no problems for doing things like lead or or, or mercury or something like that. That's that's very interesting. What about the um sensitivity in some sense not differential sensitivity now but just sensitivity limit down to what percentage can you detect copper or mercury or whatever the thing would be that's a minor component of a gold coin so it, it entirely depends on the de on the detector setup um so at the where is it
Sorry. That's it, yeah. Sorry. So th this is our detector setup. We, we, we have three. Um, the more detectors we have, the, the higher sensitivity we can get. We can get orders of magnitude increase in the sensitivity. At the moment, it really is a major element technique. It's a percentage level technique. Um, okay. But fun <laughs> fundamentally speaking, gamma rays are produced. We could, right. be doing, we could be doing isotope ratios with it. Providing we actually had a sensitive enough detector and enough detectors to increase that sensitivity, um, we could do isotope ratios. Um, we could massively increase the speed of the measurement with more detectors. At the moment, it takes about eight to 12 hours to get a really high quality reading from a gold coin. So if you want to get a percentage figure with a plus or minus kind of half percent, it takes about 12 hours. Um, more detectors mean we could get that right down um, to a much shorter period of time. And then we could use those 12 hours for doing a much more sensitive measurement and getting way below percentage level. But at the moment, three detectors, um, we're looking at major element percentage level. So again, kind of comparative to XRF. That, that's very cool. I have some ideas. I don't know if they'll pass muster with you or the, <laughs> the committees, but- well, Not me, uh, God, I'm, I'm, I'm useless. I, I, I wrap the tin foil around the coin and move things for them. They, they do the actual science. I, I sort of just take credit <laughs> for it. All right, thank you very much. This is really great stuff. No, thank you. Uh, George, just a, a couple of comments. Um, I, I'm very, very impressed by this, I have to say. Um, uh, a couple of observations. This does seem to lead uh, more to more confidence in XRF observations, uh, which is a good thing, considering how portable and inexpensive XRF is you know, for uh, certain uh, measurements. The, um, the, the fact that this is able to get considerably deeper into a coin and um, uh, allow more observations for you know, the actual fabric of, of the coin materials is equally fantastic. The concern, obviously, is just the scale of it. I mean, if, if uh, the equipment is going to remain on a very, very large scale and effectively inaccessible, um, you know, if, if the United States does not have such a facility, then you know, the, the concern obviously is going to be, you know, going forward, just how widespread and accessible this, this technique is going to be. Um, do you see a future where this will be effectively downsized and made more accessible? Um, uh, so the, the question was about the, the access to, to facilities that have muon capabilities. Um, it's really difficult. You need a, you need a synchrotron to kind of essentially strip uh, strip electrons from things. You strip electrons from hydrogen atoms, you smash them into a graphite target, and then you produce muons, which last for fractions of seconds. Um, you need really powerful magnets. You need, you need aircraft hangar style stuff. We're talking a huge leap in technological capability to turn this into something that's even, even bench top or, or lab, lab based. Um, this, is, this is really, really difficult. Um, <sighs> No, I don't think so. Not not in sort of the time frames that makes you know would make any kind of impact on our lives. Um, it's it's going to be a facility thing. Um, but that's why being able to show that um, X-ray fluorescence results and the muon results can be compared because you can screen with these available techniques and then focus in with the much more inaccessible technique. Um, part part of your comment section also said about the um, essentially the reproducibility of X of XRF results. They matched up with the uh, muons. Um, the really important thing to remember is, is that these portable XRF um, machines are as only as good as the way you calibrate them and the way you check them. Um, so I was very lucky. I've got, a, I've got a number of standards and my grants allow me to buy a number of gold standards, um, which means I can always check the accuracy of the results um, against known, um, known kind of disks of gold, basically. Um, if you just kind of wandered off with an XRF machine and then start shooting them at objects, that's when you, you can't be super sure about it. So, so absolutely, yeah, it shows that the technique, when those standards are there, is really good. And, and perhaps it's kind of a little bit too maligned um, by people with, with much better equipment. Um, it, it does do a good job when the standards are there on precious metals. Um, but without those standards for XRF, that's when it gets, it gets in troubles. Um, so it's just, just a... Just a um, yeah, just a slight thing about the reproducibility there. But, but yeah, absolutely, it's, it's great to see that a cheap and available technique like portable XRF matches up with, with, with this technique. Um, yeah. Is it possible to trace the copper to a, a region, sort of help pin it down, like you know, Spanish copper mines or, or mines in Asia or something like that? Do you think that could, is another avenue for research? 
Um, so the question about uh, tra tracing copper or provenance in copper used to base these coins. Um, it would be really difficult because I think one of the way one of the one of the ways of um, one of the ways of tracing copper is to use lead isotopes. Um, so it would be difficult to work out which lead isotopes were coming from copper and which ones are coming from silver and which ones are coming from gold in the mix. Another way you could do it is to use um, trace elements, but again, um, the gold itself will have trace element will be trace element rich. So it'd be difficult to see whether the elements are coming from um, the gold or the trace element whether the trace elements are coming from the um, the geological source of the gold, whether it's from the copper being added in. The next question is whether whether is that copper actually being literally added in? So if someone got kind of like a, a bar of copper and sort of chucked it into the melting pot of gold. Or is someone taking a bunch of gold objects that happen to contain copper, melting them down, and then using them to strike coinage? In which case, the copper hasn't been added in. It was already in another object. Maybe they're, um, not refining it. Maybe they're just making it to gold. Well, it's, it's unlikely that the copper is from a lack of um, refining, because, because gold will naturally contain very low levels of copper. And any gold that would come from kind of a, a copper-rich source, you have to um, smelt it. And that involves removing base metals, so that would be the copper gone. Um, so when you see high concentrations of copper, that's, it's, you know it's unnatural. So it's either been added in at some point in time. But if these coins, we don't know whether it's been deliberately added in or when someone's just chucked in a gold, an existing gold alloy that's, that contains copper. So provenancing a specific part of it would be, would be quite difficult. But with trace elements, you could work out whether the copper's been added in or, or it's kind of natural. So there's, there's, the silver is the easiest one to do this for. Um, so the silver, if you look at the relationship between silver and bismuth and lead, if the, if the concentration of silver increases as a con and the concentration of lead and bismuth increase, you can be quite confident that the silver has been deliberately added in. If there's no relationship, you can be kind of more confident that it's, it's part of, it hasn't been split from the gold. Um, so you can do something like that with, with silver, but, but provenancing the debasing materials is going to be really difficult. It, it's, it's difficult enough to provenance the actual gold, um, let alone kind of the small things inside it. So I, th I think they'll kind of be beyond um, beyond our understanding at the moment. But I'm sure if someone who knows way more than me about it would, might be able to do it at one point in time. Yeah. So maybe. Um, since we're getting close, well, it's about 7 p.m. now. But uh, um, I'd like to ask maybe one more question. Um, I have a quick question. question. Okay. Okay. Wait, where will you publish this, or have you published it? Um, so it, it, it's currently uh, un going out for publication. Um, so we're submitting it to journals. Uh, it, it's, it's currently under consideration um, at, the, at the Journal for Archaeological Anthropo Anthropological Sciences, but it hasn't yet been um, sent out for review, or I think even got through the desk. But we are actively sending it out to, to journals at the moment. So the, um, the, the question, uh, um, maybe the sound is not so good, so I'm, I'm getting closer to you and to your mic. Um, is, is there are many controversies, as you know, uh, about uh, more challenging coinage, like, uh, like the tetrarchic uh, billion coinage and the proportion of silver, uh, or the Aurelianic uh, reform coinage, and so on. But the one coinage I have in mind, and, that Peter knows very well, which is the uh, Asia Minor um, Electron. Um, obviously, that could be very helpful. But now, do you think that the shape and you know, the size and shape of the electron points, since they are not, they sort of thicker, it's not as flat as, as, uh, as Roman gold, do you think the shape may uh, kind of uh, present the, the you know, this method of being fully effective? No, 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 no. Um, this thing is so penetrative, it, it can go through it. The, the, it being a bit wobbly doesn't matter. Um, it can go straight. It's not like XRF where you're, where you're bouncing the X-rays off, well, essentially bounce them off the surface and you kind of get some problems with it, um, the angle of diffraction. Um, it's nothing like that at all because the muons go deep beneath um, the surface. They go in between kind of the individual atoms and they only get captured by the atoms at the very center, and then the X-ray is produced. Um, it doesn't matter about the kind of the topography of the surface. You could get a gold coin, wrap it in a bunch of mud, um, and then fire the, uh, fire the muons through it, and it goes all the way through. Um, the coins in our study are wrapped in aluminum foil, um, which is obviously crinkly and 
bubbly and it's got all different levels to it and it goes straight through it. It's, it's, it's not a problem. Um, early electron coinage is something we really want to have a look at. Um, the heat map um, uh, capability is something I think would be really cool to see if there's a um, heterogeneous mix in the, in the alloy itself um, with, with the heat map style thing, but that, that's been quite difficult. But yeah, a very basic kind of um, right through the middle, looking at the middle of them is something we, we definitely, definitely want to do. Um, and it's on, on, on our list of um, proposals to submit. Early electron coins from Samos that was published by Corey Kunuk in 2015, if I remember right, or 2005, in which he, um, I, I think these were analyzed by XRF, but they detected a certain amount of copper in those coins, and um, some sort of comparative with that specific yeah. group actually would be uh, really interesting because his conclusion with that set of coins was that the copper was deliberately added to yeah. bring the color up, and that's oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, we see this in kind of um, uh, Egyptian New Kingdom objects. Um, you see it in the Armana letters where the king of Mesopotamia complains about um, the pharaoh's kind of magic gold, where that he puts it into the fire and suddenly kind of 10% of it disappears. You know, it's got magic disappearing gold. Um, because the Mesopotamians were able to split gold from silver and make pure gold, the Egyptians were doing it by chucking a bunch of copper in to make it look pure gold. So we know this is going on. It's been going on for thousands of years. So um, yeah, without doubt, if, if, there's, if, you're, if they're detecting unusually high concentrations of copper, it's probably being deliberately added in to bring up the color, prob probably. Um. Thank you for watching the American Numismatic Society's YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you like our online resources, publication, and events, you can support the Society by becoming a member. And don't forget to check out our book and eBay stores. The links are below.